Just before we get started, I do want to say that if you're thinking, Simon, you don't make enough videos every week, well, good news. I've got a new channel. It's called Relatively New Channel. It's called Business Blaze. It's sort of like this. It's a bit more free form, and obviously it's about business, but it's fun, I promise. It is linked to below. I'd love it if you went to check it out, and let's get into the video. When Hennig Brands first started playing with massive amounts of human urine, he wasn't looking to become the first to discover a new element since ancient times. Instead, he was convinced that this liquid held the key to a very different scientific breakthrough. Born in 1630 into relatively modest means in Hamburg, Germany, not much is known of Brand's early life. But it is believed he was a junior army officer during the Thirty Years' War, likely right at the end of the war. After he left the army, he became an apprentice glassmaker. He married well to a woman whose dowry was rather substantial. In fact, he married so well that he was able to leave the world of glassmaking to pursue his true passion, searching for the Philosopher's Stone. Yes, Brand quit his day job to become an Alchemist. As no doubt anyone who has paid any attention at all in the history part of chemistry class or simply read or watched the first Harry Potter knows, the Philosopher's Stone is a legendary object and substance that was said to be capable of turning basic metals, lead, zinc, nickel, iron, into gold. It was also said that the Philosopher's Stone could hold the key to the elixir of life, immortality, and eternal youth. The discovery of it was pursued by many scientists throughout the Renaissance and Middle Ages, including ones that earned their stripes making real contributions to science. Roger Bacon, the scientific method, Robert Boyle, father of modern chemistry, and Isaac Newton, the universal law of gravity, among other things, were among the scientists who more than dabbled in the field of alchemy. Like the others, Brands performed experiments in pursuit of the Philosopher's Stone. Unfortunately, performing experiments in pursuit of a mythical object wasn't exactly profitable, and he soon burned through his and his wife's available funds. Around this time, he began calling himself Dr. Brand, despite no record of him receiving a degree of any kind anywhere. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately for his finances, his first wife passed away and he married a wealthy widow named Margaretha. She gave Brands the financial means to build a lab to continue his work as well as a child she had a son from a previous marriage to help him in the lab. Brands was particularly interested in how water combines with other things and thought since water was the basis of life, there must be mystical properties to it. Additionally, there was a belief that human bodies themselves may hold the key to alchemy. After all, things went into humans and they came out as something different. Building on this idea, Brand found in an alchemy cookbook entitled 400 Orsalense Chemistry Process by F. T. Kessler of Strasbourg, written in 1630, a recipe calling for alum, potassium nitrate, and concentrated human urine. According to the recipe, this would turn basic metals into gold. Brand first used his own urine in his experiments towards this end, but it soon became clear that he would need much more of it. It isn't precisely known where he acquired the vast amounts of human urine he is thought to have used. Some claim he initially took it from his wife and her friends. Others claim he approached the German army and requested to collect the soldiers' urine. It was also said that he was especially interested in beer drinkers' urine because it had a yellow hue to it. In the end, it is thought that he collected upwards of 1,500 gallons of urine over the course of his experiments. Whether those specifics are true or not, Brand did collect vats of human urine and began his attempts to turn the golden liquid into literal gold. While the exact method used by Brand is slightly up for debate, it is generally thought he first let the urine sit in the sun for several weeks because, well, alchemy we guess. He then boiled the now rancid liquid until it was a thick syrup-like substance. This was then heated until a red oil formed at the top, which he extracted. Next, he had the substance sit in his cellar to cool until it had turned black with a salty lower layer, which was discarded. He then mixed the black part with the red oil and heated it. Finally, he distilled it through a retort. What filled the glass chamber was glowing fumes that turned into a shining white liquid as it dripped out of the retort. As soon as it did that, and upon contact with oxygen, it produced flames and gave off a garlic-like smell. As written, by John Emsley in his book The Thirteenth Element. 
When he caught the liquid in a glass vessel and stopped it, he saw that it solidified but continued to gleam with an eerie pale green light and waves of flames seemed to lick its surface. Fascinated, he watched it more closely, expecting this curious cold fire to go out, but it continued to shine undiminished hour after hour. Here was magic indeed. Brand needed a name for his magical discovery, so he went with Phosphorus, meaning Morning Star, a Greek name for Venus, which derived from Phos, meaning light, and Phoros, meaning bearer or light bearer. He told no one of his discovery for six years for fear it would be stolen from him and might even put him in danger. So, how did this method produce phosphorus? This is thanks to the phosphates in urine. Under high heat, the oxygen in the phosphate reacts with carbon, making carbon monoxide. When the phosphate loses its oxygen in the process, it becomes phosphorus, which at high heat is emitted as a gas. This cools to form solid phosphorus. It's estimated that Brand used 5,500 liters, about 1,500 gallons of urine, to produce just 120 grams of phosphorus, or nearly 40 46 liters, or 12 gallons for every gram of phosphorus. Funnily enough, he needn't have waited until the urine was rancid. Had he simply used his method right away with fresh urine, he wouldn't have seen a difference in the yield. However, he could have gotten a huge boost in yield had he not discarded the salt portion, which contains a large portion of the phosphate in urine. Had he kept it, he would have been able to produce about one gram of pure white phosphorus per nine liters of human urine instead of per 46 liters. In any event, Brands continued to experiment with the substance, learning that it could be stored in water but when exposed to air that it would glow and occasionally burst into flames. He used the light it gave off to read his alchemy texts, and he even used it to create glow-in-the-dark ink. Despite his sincerest efforts, however, one thing he couldn't do was get it to turn basic metals into gold. After six years, Brand finally accepted that it not created the Philosopher's Stone, but something completely different, something unknown. Whatever it was, Brand had little use for it. He was also broke, having gone through his second wife's money just as he did with his first. And so it was that upon hearing the rumors of this new material that far outshone any others, chemist Johann Kunkel visited Brand and asked to purchase all of his phosphorus and any more he made. At this point, Brand was still being secretive on how he produced it. Soon, word got out to other chemists, including to Daniel Kraft, and Brand had a bidding war in his hands for the method of how to make the substance. Eventually, he spilled the beans on his human urine recipe, and others began to replicate and go further with his experiments. From there, Brand faded into obscurity as other chemists, including Kunkel, Kraft, and Robert Boyle, were popularly thought of as the discoverers of phosphorus, the first new element discovered since ancient times. Brand died in the early 18th century. The exact date isn't known, not being given proper credit for his discovery. Luckily for him, letters found from his second wife, Margarita, and acquaintances finally resulted in Brand getting his due, but well after his death. And now for some bonus facts. Humans have been trying to turn various substances into gold since at least 300 AD, but it wouldn't be until 1980 that someone would actually do it. The man was previous Nobel Prize winner Glenn T. Seaborg. Beyond several other contributions to the world of science, as you might have guessed from that Nobel Prize, in 1980 he decided to see if he could be the first to achieve the alchemist's dream. Thus, he used a particle accelerator to propel beams of carbon and neon nuclei at nearly the speed of light into foils of the heavy metal bismuth. You know, the stuff you find in relatively large quantities in Pepto-Bismol used for shotgun pellets and a variety of other applications. So why bismuth rather than something like lead, which was so often played with by alchemists? That's because it's simply easier to isolate gold from bismuth than it is from lead. However, producing gold from lead would have been no more difficult. As for the result, when they were rifling through the carnage that was the result of the high-speed collision between neon, carbon, and bismuth, the physicists discovered that they had successfully made several isotopes of gold. Of course, none of this was economical in the slightest. According to Seaborg, it would cost more than one quadrillion dollars per ounce to produce gold by this experiment. The going rate for gold in 1980 was about $590 an ounce. Still, regardless of cost, finally, after at least a couple thousand years of effort by some of the finest minds in history, a human had finally created gold from something else. And now for another bonus fact. Moving on from there, speaking of making things from urine, it turns out it can be used to make gunpowder. 
You see, gunpowder is comprised of 75% potassium nitrate, 15% charcoal, and 10% sulfur. While charcoal, historically made with wood, and sulfur, historically dug from the ground around volcanoes, have been relatively easy to obtain, potassium nitrate is not commonly found in nature. Early sources were found in caves where guano, bat poo, had combined with minerals from the cave walls. Then soaking and filtering the guano was an effective method, but there are only so many caves and only so much bat poo. With an increasing need as gun warfare became more common, by the time of the US Civil War, men were manufacturing potassium nitrate in huge amounts. One process, known as the French method, involved mixing manure with ashes, straw, and urine. The mixture would be tended for many months, sometimes even a year, then filtered through more ashes and a bit of water. A second process, called the Swiss method, involved placing a sand pit directly under a stable. Only the urine made it into the sand, which would be harvested and filtered in the same manner as the French method. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, that channel I mentioned at the beginning, Business Blaze, I'm linking to it below. Please go check it out and thank you for watching.